So we're going to be talking this morning, uh, early this morning actually, uh, about uh, adult mesenchymal stem cells. You've probably heard an awful lot about uh, embryonic stem cells, perhaps a little bit less about adult stem cells, although adult stem cells are really coming into the news right now. Uh, as you know, a, a stem cell is a cell that can differentiate into other cells, so sort of a, a, a cell that's uh, got the ability to do a lot of different things. You can see here uh, embryonic stem cells versus mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, there's actually more research on uh, adult mesenchymal stem cells, at least with regard to uh, preclinical trials, than there are currently in embryonic stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells, and it's, that's just one of the types of adult stem cells that live in your body. Uh, they've got a lot of different functions you can see here that can differentiate into bone, cartilage, muscle, uh, ligament, tendon. They also have a unique uh, aspect and they act as a construction manager. They can actually uh, help other cells to repair tissue and they can easily be obtained through a bone marrow aspirate, uh, synovial fluid, lots of different methods. As far as taking these stem cells from the lab uh, to the clinic, you've got to look at a bunch of different types of things in any stem cell clinical translation. Do you use someone else's cells, which is obviously allogeneic? Do you use uh, the patient's own cells, autologous, IV versus placement at the target site? Uh, trying to get a consistent cell to grow and tracking complications. As far as allogeneic cells or someone else's cells, uh, there's a little bit of a problem with that that's developing in the literature right now. Uh, one of the things that has been discussed is that the genes of the donor cells remain active in the host. Now that can be used for good. If you saw about six months ago, there was a, uh, a paper uh, I think it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, on a patient whose HIV AIDS was cured by using someone else's CD3-4 positive heme progenitors. And that was actually this effect. Obviously, it can also go the other way. If you're bringing over genes from the host that are bad, that might be a problem. Also, uh, it, it had been thought that these cells were completely invisible to the host immune system, but that's not so sure anymore in the medical literature. So a number of different issues with regard to someone else's stem cells being used, at least at the moment. An easy way to get stem cells into someone would just obviously be to inject them IV. Uh, however, there is a pulmonary first pass effect when you do that. So basically, a lot of the stem cells that you might want to have end up in someone's heart or their knee uh, or their liver are going to end up in their lungs. Uh, at least when it comes to adult stem cells that they've tested. So right now, injecting them IV, probably not the best way to get there, probably better to place them in the target tissue. Um, obviously, if you're gonna take these cells, usually they have to be grown to much bigger numbers over time. Uh, the way to grow them to much bigger numbers over time, however, it can involve some things like uh, animal products being used that can obviously cause some issues. Uh, using exogenous growth factors, etc. That's actually a Chinese stop sign, or at least so I think. <laughs> I, I don't know if it says stop in Chinese, but uh, this was uh, from a, uh, a lecture I gave over there, so I, uh, I'm hoping it was a stop sign. But complications tracking obviously becomes important once you place these cells in. You would want a way to track some of the sites where they've been placed. You would want a way to uh, track some of the patients at least for five years. You also would need to look at things like dose. How many cells uh, is the right number of cells? Is it a million? Is it 10 million? Is it 50 million? Uh, time and culture. Uh, what other factors can negatively impact these cells? When it comes to dose, obtaining therapeutic numbers of cells in a, in a single uh, culture cycle can be pretty difficult to do. We've been doing this for about four years, uh, so we've gotten pretty good at it, but it's, it certainly can be a challenge. Time and culture. You would think that you would just grow these cells to bigger numbers uh, and you could just do that to get as many as you would need. Not necessarily. The longer you keep them in culture, the less active they become or less biologically active they become. 
Also, if they're grown after or for more than about 60 days in culture, they, you can actually start to see problems in the cell line. So uh, there really is a two-edged sword of keeping them in culture long enough to get bigger numbers, but not uh, so long as you would start to develop problems. Uh, age is interesting. Uh, there are a number of different studies that would seem to show that if you try to keep these, or if you try to use older cells, there may be a problem. There are other studies that show there are no issues, there's just fewer cells. So that's, uh, that's still up for grabs right now. Uh, with regard to uh, sex, our own unpublished data uh, seems to show that in perimenopausal women, not in younger women, not in older women, but in perimenopausal women, we have a much harder time with uh, autologous culture expansion, which is pretty interesting. It may, that obviously may explain some of the things we see with bone loss really starting to ramp up in perimenopausal women. Uh, as far as the procedural issues, one of the problems that we see is that once you place these cells into a syringe for injection, you've got about a two-hour window to re-inject them. And while it doesn't sound like a big deal, getting them from the lab to the place where they're being used in that amount of time uh, can be a problem. Patient shows up late for treatment, that can be a big problem. 